Welcome to Spotlight on Fairs. My name is Greg Dixon. I'm the CEO of Smart Recycling Management. We want to thank you for being here this afternoon. We want to thank you for being here at ISRI. Hope you're enjoying yourself and uh, learning a lot and uh, buying a lot of equipment. We've got two very good speakers for you this afternoon, and both of them are going to give some presentations, and then we're going to have a little Q and answer, and we hope during that that you'll be glad to chime in. We'll have some microphones uh, throughout the crowd, so just get our attention. We'd like to hear from you as well. Also, one other note, after today's meeting, there is going to be the Fairs Consumer Reception. So when we leave, if you'll go out those doors at the top, that's where everyone will need to exit, and the reception is going to be up in that area. We hope that you'll, you'll join us there. Our first speaker today is Becky Heights. She's the president of Steel Insight. She worked on Wall Street for over 10, uh, 16 years in New York City, and she spent 10 years at World Steel Dynamics also. She started her own business, Steel Insight, four years ago, and I really think she did it just to move back to Atlanta to, to enjoy that nice weather down there. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Becky. Thanks so much, um, and thanks to ISRI. It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard about the ISRI conventions for years, but this is my first one, so it's fun to be here. So I entitled my speech, uh, USA Steel, King of the Mardi Gras Parade, or Skipping Fat Tuesday for Ash Wednesday. And the point being that the steel industry has changed a lot, and to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we've been. So if you look back um, to when I was born uh, in the 60s, steel represented 26% of global steel production in the USA, and, uh, and it peaked in the, uh, in the 70s, and now it's less than 5%. So it's less relevant globally, and it's also less relevant to the USA GDP. So I say the U.S. steel industry is having an identity crisis. It doesn't exactly remember where it fits. It thinks it knows where it used to be, but it, it kind of doesn't know how to figure out where it is today. And I say this because I was at a conference maybe a year ago, and I had a trade lawyer ask uh, how many people in the room still think that the U.S. steel industry is relevant to GDP, to the global, uh, to the USA economy. And of course, all, being good steel people, we all raised our hands. And he was like, yeah, it's not. So when you're hearing about trade, or you're hearing about positioning, or you're hearing about all these things, um, it's, you have to think of it under a different uh, microscope because the steel industry is not what it used to be. And so it's treated differently. Um, the other thing that I put on here, just to keep in mind, is the strong US dollar really impacts our industry. And as traders, if you're trading internationally, you know this to be true. And it happens despite what we do. It happens away from us, right? It's, it's, so it's beyond our control, but it definitely impacts how our lives are, are um, viewed. OK, so and then just take a little bit a step back, because we're going to talk about the global overcapacity. But just to put it in perspective, the US has already done a lot of house cleaning. Uh, we've, we've closed uh, over 50 million tons of capacity since the 1990s. We have about 8 million tons of capacity offline now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why when you hear um, all of the uh, pundits talking about, we've done our business, the world needs to kind of reform, um, the reason is because we've done the hard things and so other people haven't. And so by comparison, um, the people are trying to hold the standard across the board. So everybody knows, of course, in 2008 we had the financial crisis. And uh, for the steel industry, if you look at the years um, below 2010, the U.S. industry, and I'm looking at the shipments uh, numbers right now in the first four or five columns, you know, we had had a nice recovery to 2014, back to about 103 or 103 million tons of shipments, and consumption was about 128, and that was a pretty nice recovery. And then things started to slow down. And not only did they slow down in 15 and 16, but the U.S. mills lost market share of a smaller market. So imports stayed high. They were at 47.6 at the peak, the, the latest peak in 2014. And in 2015, they came down by 5 million tons. But look, the consumption came down by 10. So now looking at the far right column, uh, market share for the US mills dropped to below 80%. And so this, this is where all the pain is coming from. When, you, when you're saying, why is everybody uh, expressing the aggravation, this is where it's coming from. And so in 2016, you saw that uh, moderate a little bit. Um, there was only about a. 5% drop in consumption, but the mills only dropped about 1%. So they gained a little bit of market share back from imports. But quite frankly, um, no matter what happens, and I do believe trade is being, uh, the trade enforcement issues are being uh, more effectively uh, looked at, um, 
imports are really not going to go away. And in truth, when I started in the business in the 80s, of course, you repeat whatever you're told, and then, and then you, get to, you get to have a serious discussion about the fact, if our market is really strong, we actually need imports. So, but we don't need them to be 20 or 30% of our market when our market is not strong. And that's the, the, the basic debate. So I say the industry is still in distress. In 2016, the overall capacity utilization was still below 70%. Uh, everybody here knows the steel industry uh, requires a lot of fixed investment in capital. And if you're not utilizing that capital, that's not a good thing. Um, there's a little bit of a bifurcation. The EAF mills did a little bit better. And the flat rolled mills did better than the long mills. So recently, uh, USA crude steel production has been improving. This is actually encouraging, and we're actually starting to see that in the market. Um, EAF mills, I think most of everybody here is aware there's been a shift in how steel gets made. Um, historically, in the 50s and 60s, it was made through the, the integrated route through BOFs using iron ore and coking coal. Um, and now over half of the market is produced from some mix in an electric arc furnace, which used to be 100% dominated by scrap and now has mixed more to scrap and some kind of scrap substitute, whether it be DRI, HBI, or pig iron. And again, that's a bifurcation because the bar mills still use 100% scrap. So it depends upon the product you're making, the metallics mix that you need. So this was just a picture of the uh, consumption. We looked at the overall consumption, and this was just the product categories. And this, this uh, list flipped in December. The short list was only about five products, and the, the positive was just really not very positive. And in January, this turned, and you've seen a, a pretty big improvement in uh, February and March. You haven't seen it in the numbers yet because they're not out, but just basically talking to people in the market. Most products are doing pretty well right now. And just for you guys, um, these slides will be on my website um, in the next week or so, so you can get them from there if Isri doesn't share them with you. I do a leading economic indicator scorecard, just a heat map to see uh, the direction of how the economy is doing. Um, and, and you'll see, so looking at the bar chart on the bottom, um, it had been pretty strong and then it got a little soft. It's gotten a little strong again towards the end of the year. And then seasonally was weak in January and February. So I expect these numbers are up pretty significantly uh, for March and April once we see the numbers. And my question um, is whether it's going to continue into July and August or if we're going to get a summer slowdown, which is then going to be reflected in the steel industry. So the U.S. has got a couple of things, and this is the reason I'm a little worried about the economy. We have a jobs challenge, and I just pulled some, um, some documentation from our now Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and Peter Navarro, who is also in the White House on trade. Uh, basically, we lost um, a lot of manufacturing, 5 million manufacturing jobs in lots and lots of factories. And I do believe we've reversed this. I do believe we will be regaining um, the jobs that were lost, but you can't do it overnight, is my principal point. The U.S. has a business tax challenge. We have a tax challenge on a couple of levels. We have a trade tax issue. We have a tax uh, renumerification issue. And we also have a business tax issue. So uh, again, I think that there are uh, lots of teams looking at how to fix these things, but it's not going to be a simple fix, and it's not going to be implemented overnight. And we have a trade challenge. Um, and it's interesting because uh, people always ask me, oh, what's going to happen with trade now that with the new administration? Is there going to be a border tax? How is this going to impact? And one of the first things you heard Wilbur Ross say, and I was uh, privileged enough to be in D.C. during his Senate confirmation hearing, so I actually went to the hearings, is one of the things he said is we need to increase our exports. Well, you know, just losing logic, if you want people to buy your stuff, you can't um, make them all angry enough at you that they won't discuss anything with you. So if we block all of their imports, they're certainly not going to buy our exports. So the reality is what he was telegraphing was we need to be reasonable trade partners, and whatever that means. Now, interestingly, this morning, um, they announced a, um, a punitive measure against Canadian lumber in response to the Canadian block, the Canada blocking our dairy. So for sure, these measures are going to be implemented, but probably on a one-on-one -on -one basis and probably uh, for strategic purposes. So it's so fascinating, too, because all the rhetoric on TV and in discussions is, oh, it's a trade war, it's a trade war. And I found this, uh, this cartoon uh, from several years ago, 2000 and, no, I don't, I don't have the date on there. At any rate, um, 2010. 
So where a cartoonist had taken the time to write out that we really were already in a trade war, the US just wasn't fighting. We were just taking the beat down. And what's changed is we're, we're not going to continue to be in bad deals. Um, and it was interesting, Dick and I were talking earlier about negotiating. And um, one of the things you have to be um, prepared for in a negotiation is you have to be prepared to disagree and, and not just cave. And, and so basically, as the United States, we really just haven't been holding our own ground. So we've really been taking whatever was given to us. So switching gears a little bit, China continues to export. Um, the net export last year was 103 million tons. I was at a speech last year overseas, and they basically told, their, told us they're planning on dropping this over the next five years to 60 million tons. Okay? It's not a number we like in the US, but the truth of the matter is they've told us what they're going to do. And so to just ignore what they've told us and to hope that they're going to drop back to 10 million tons, that's just foolishness. So I keep this slide in here to keep everybody aware they are going to continue to export and at numbers that, that are higher than we like. This is just showing the consolidation in the industry. The top 20 producing uh, steel companies account for half of the global production now. Um, Chinese companies are about half of that production. And we only have one US producer on this list. Again, this goes back to the whole identity crisis. One of the things that's changed, and I'm going to talk about the global economy a little bit, is the colonial model of you can't make it for yourself, so I'll make it and ship it back to you, just really no longer holds. And this came out of the rise, the meteoric rise, of raw material costs and also steel prices in the mid-2000s. And there were a lot of countries that said, why are we paying uh, these huge prices? We can buy the raw materials and make it here for cheaper. We can, we can beat their conversion costs. And so what happened was we basically, because we didn't price our products right, we as an industry now, I'm saying, we encouraged um, development away from us. And, and now um, all of these markets are really self-supplied. And, and so we have to change our business model because we can't just continue producing at the levels that would supply them because they don't really need that from us. So let's talk for about China for a second. Um, so China is taking uh, steps to being, an, uh, to being a global trade partner. I can remember when I joined Peter Markets in 2003, um, everybody was bemoaning, oh, the Chinese, they need to come into the market. They need to be market players. And now that they're in the market, we're like, oh, the Chinese are in their market. They're disrupting our market. So I guess it's one of those things where you're never really happy. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, um, and I don't know who you follow in China, but I, I really enjoy listening to Jack Ma from Alibaba. He's just so interesting. But when I was in Europe last year, he, he said, this is the second bullet point, um, China believes the road to greater prosperity is increasing trade. Trade is a human right, he said. And then um, at Davros last year, or just a couple of months ago, he said, it's not that the countries, other countries are stealing your jobs, it's just you haven't distributed your money properly. And this, I mean, I worked on Wall Street for years. It's like, cry me a river, run your business better, is basically what he was saying. So China J, uh, joining the WTO 15 years ago was a bit of a game changer. It changed um, our ability to act independently. There are things that we used to do, for instance, VRAs, that are really illegal for us to do now. So there are different tools. We have to use our different tools. Um, there's, there are standards. There were standards that were agreed to in the WTO. And what you're seeing now is, is increasing verbalization of making sure everybody's living up to those standards. And I think you'll continue to hear those uh, discussions, but um, I absolutely guarantee to you, at some point, China will obtain market economy status. It might be five years, it might be 10 years, it might be 15 years, I don't know what it's going to be, but it definitely will happen. So one of the things I talk about is China's capitalistic, except when it's not. Um, it took the US several decades to reduce its, over, its, over, its overcapacity in steelmaking. China really could reduce it tomorrow if they got serious about it. Um, again, while I was at World Steel Dynamics, Peter Marcus was the person who taught me this. When the Chinese decided that they didn't want any more beehive oven uh, coke making, they sent around trucks and picked up the ovens. You know, so we think of the world in capitalistic terms. I have money, I can buy power. I have money, I can buy iron ore. Well, yeah, that's fine in China, except if China decides that they don't want you to have power and then you won't have power. So just keep in mind when you're hearing these things, they built their industry a lot faster than we could have. And if they choose to pull it back, they can pull it back a lot faster too. I'm not saying they're going to. We don't really know when they're going to. Um, they also are capitalistic, again, except when they're not. When I was in China in 2008, there was a fuel shortage. And the reason was because the Chinese government had told the fuel companies they couldn't sell the gasoline at a profit. They told them, it's your turn to give back. 
You know, I asked the manager of the gas station, how do you feel about that? He's like, I don't like it. So I'm selling the minimum I have to to every customer, which is why they're all lined up waiting for to get gas, because they're going to get some gas from me, and they're going to drive down the road and get some gas from the next guy, because they really needed to fill the tank, but I won't sell them that much gas. So my, my principal point is, don't view China, China always as Western, because they are sometimes, and sometimes they're not. So just a couple of uh, final slides here. I'm a little bit behind my time. China isn't the only country uh, providing support to its steel industry. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, but there's a couple of other uh, issues, uh, uh, instances listed. Uh, the global steel market is still significantly oversupplied. It's going to be oversupplied for a long time. This isn't going to go away anytime soon. It's not going to be an easy process. Um, you know, the raw material price spikes at the end of last year, I think, started the price rises in the, fin in the finished goods uh, area. And I think demand is good, but I'm not sure it's strong enough to justify the rise that we've seen in pricing. So um, I'm a little worried that there's a little bit of vulnerability here. I think I just said that. There's an oversupply. Well, the other thing that happened from the oversupply is people kind of ran back home. So the world was global, and now it's maybe a little less global. People are not comfortable that globalization is OK. Maybe you need to protect yourself. And you see this trade actions have been taken around the world in almost every product and almost every market. So again, this is nothing new. This has been happening for a while. So one of the things behind this is what kind of drove this. And if you look, this is just nominal GDP. So GDP in 2015 was actually revised down. So as the economy shrunk, people had to reposition themselves. And I throw this in here. I was an econ economics uh, major undergraduate. There's a long super wave called a K wave. And it, the, the principal idea is that there are times when economies are in sync with each other. And, there are, and, and when, the, when the world's economies, when all the countries are in sync at the same time, it puts stressors on the supply, on supply chain. And so now what we've had, because the economies were in sync for, such a, for five or six years uh, back to back, there was a lot of capital invested to increase the supply chain. And now that the economies are back out of sync, there's pretty much excess supply in most anything you could want, which is then putting pressure on pricing. The developed world uh, still accounts for about half of the global economy, but that's decreasing. The top 10 uh, economies still represent two-thirds of global GDP. Um, but interestingly, they're not set, because in 2015, South Korea displaced Russia in the top 10. So one of the things that I talk about is businesses like stability to make good decisions, right? If you're going to aggressively ramp something up, you want to have some modicum of um, comfort that five minutes after you make your decision, it won't prove to be a mistake. And we're still living in a world that's got a lot of vulnerability. There's a lot of uncertainty. People don't know what's going on with economies. People don't know what's going on with politics. People don't know what's going on with migration. There are just so many issues right now uh, that people are really kind of have kept their head down. They're trying to just not get burned, right? So people are not moving on the aggressive, I want to build an empire. They're really saying, I just don't want to get burned. So until some of these things get worked through, uh, we're not really going to see the economies come back into strong growth. So I throw the oil prices in here because uh, oil income funds a lot of uh, developing world countries' budgets. Um, so uh, the principal thing to take away from this chart, and you can read the data later, is Iran is coming back into the market. OPEC seems to be holding. Prices have held up a little bit better. But they're not going to rise back to $80 a ton, There's just or $80 a barrel. There's just too much supply being integrated back into the system. So maybe it holds the 40 50 level uh, for a little while here. And if that's a good level, that's, a, that's actually a decent level. And honestly, about above that level or at that level, the US starts to get more aggressive about being our, uh, bringing back in our shale energy. And this is just a chart showing where uh, the oil supply is coming from. I'm going to leave it up here a second so this guy can get his picture. <laughs> um, all right. So um, this just looks at the world. Um, actually, the SMA, uh, the steel, not the SMA, the uh, World Steel Association just put out numbers yesterday. They're looking for a little bit higher growth in 2016 than I am. I'm up, what, 0.3%. And then they're looking at 2017 being down. I'm seeing it exactly the opposite. Um, I think that you know we, we came out of the gate pretty strong here. I think we're going to have a little bit of easing towards the end of the year. And then I think next year will be a pretty solid year. Um, so we'll see. One of the things I always, always to emphasize is the world changes. You know, you can't keep just doing things the way you always did because the world's going to change away from you. And if you're not thinking about how the world is changing around you and how you can change with it, um, you're going to be surprised. So given the fact that my practice is strategic, I like to always kind of remind people, think a little broader than you're thinking. 
This is just what Steel Insights does. Again, you can go and look at my website. I'll have to tell you, we were just talking about this. There are three people using this name. I've trademarked it, but I didn't trademark it fast enough, so I can't force them not to. But my name has a, a hyphen in it. So uh, when you're looking for me, look for the company with the hyphen. I was on Wall Street long enough to say, don't believe a word I say, do your own research. And then just that's questions, which I think we're going to take later. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Dick. <laughs> Thank you very much, Becky. Definitely appreciate the insight there and, and look forward to discussing some things with you here in just a second. I do want to remind you again that the Ferris reception will be immediately following this. So when you depart, for those of you who came in just a little bit late, if you go out the doors upstairs, that's where they're going to have some things set up and hopefully we can talk to you a little bit up there. Uh, our next speaker is John Harris. He's probably not a stranger to, to most of you. John has spoken here six or seven times. We're glad to have him back again. Uh, he retired from ArcelorMittal in 2011 after 11 years as Director of Raw Materials and Technical Applications. Since 2011, he has uh, started his own company called Aristic Services, Inc., and he's done all kinds of things all over the world. He's a good friend of mine. I'm proud to have him back. Thanks, John. Thank you. this thing move it here? There we go. I don't see anybody laughing. Why is NOLA's key lime pie like global metallics? Well, I have a pet fetish that I have. I only enjoy key lime pie for dessert. Otherwise, I won't eat dessert. And I've asked all over the world for key lime pie, and the best key lime pie that I've ever had was about 10 years ago when I was at this event here in New Orleans at Bubba Gump's. And that's me, a couple of days ago, in trying to verify that they still have, and guess what, they do. These are topics that I'm going to very quickly go through for you. I'm going to talk about world product, worldwide production, steel reservoir, China trends, utilization rates, the steel balance production consumption, and liquid steel cost, and lastly, chaos factors. Just like for those that may have come from the EAF, meeting that was just before this, I made a parting comment. Everybody should have an EAF and a small portable EAF, not unlike the shredding business where they have portable shredders. And oh, just tie them to a 3D printer. And people laugh. Guess what? Have you seen what 3D printing is doing? I'll get to that later. Let's get into it. This is what the market looks like. Becky went through it pretty good with regards to the figures. But the bottom line, NAFTA is 110 million metric tons. Europe's about 166 million, and China's sitting at 800. That's what's controlling the marketplace right there. And India is going to keep going. This is what the raw materials is doing in NAFTA. If you take it the global number, 1.6 million. You take it the NAFTA number. Now you go over and take a look at BOFs and electrics and look at the percentage differences to the world versus NAFTA. And this is your market because the electric arc furnace in NAFTA is the reigning leader and they need scrap. The rest of the world, it's not true. And we see this when we look at the differentials between bushling and shredded and heavy melt. When we go anywhere else in the world, the differential is only 10 bucks. The, man, the demand isn't, it's different because the electrics globally are not flat carbon electric. That's your difference. The driving force is the flat carbon electric that needs clean, low residual steels. If you go down a little bit further, you'll see that the yearly prompt scrap generation, somewhere around 16 million tons, that is also 
what the consumption is. So that's why you get that spread in it. So the scrap usage is also declining because of DRI. And DRI is very, very important to the flat carbon electrics if they're going to do that low residual steels. That's the key. <clears throat> this is just a quick look at the global scrap flows. As you can see, we're an exporter in NAFTA. If we export a lot of tons, guess what? Your price goes up. We don't export a lot of tons, guess what? It's come back down. And if you go back 20 years, when scrap was 100 bucks, we were only exporting 5 million tons a year in NAFTA. Everybody talks about what's the reservoir look like, the scrap reservoir. Well, scrap is a, near, a really weird item. You gotta go find it with the exception of the industrial scrap. Everything else has to be found, touched, calculated, whether it's pick and pull, whether it's shredders. The whole gamut comes into play. I did the calculations based on production, consumption, and steel making practices and how much scrap they needed. And if you look at this, the, uh, the tonnage represents 27 million tons, billion tons, billion tons, globally. If we look at it from a China perspective and a NAFTA perspective, in the last, since 1990, the, was, the reservoir has grown here, 2.3 billion. In China, it's 8.1 billion. And that's all representative of the difference in the tonnage that they're producing versus what we are producing. What are the global factors affecting NAFTA steelmakers? Well, China's a big one. I'll leave it for a moment. India's 90 million going to 230 million. Brazil <clears throat> and Australia has excess iron, iron ore. And it's approximately 50 million tons. So that holds down the iron ore costs, or the iron ore sales prices going into all parts of the world. If you move down further, you go to North Korea. We all have heard of what's going on there, and China stopped their coal. That's a tough one for them. Iran, Iran's a mover and shaker. They're getting into the DRI. They got the gas, they got the iron ore. They're a going concern. So when, when you take a look at Iran, they're gonna be in 2017, they're gonna be 32 million, and they're going towards 55 million. You look at Russia. Russia now is holding back on shipping scrap into Turkey because they've increased their steelmaking capacity from <coughs> up to 31% from 22%. So they're putting in electrics. And I think that was a comment for the electric growth in the previous session. Turkey, on the other hand, they run a balancing act. If the billet costs this much and the scrap costs this much, I stop the EAF and I roll the billet. I buy the billet and roll it. It's the pivotal point. And it affects the entire market. EU politics, I won't talk about that, but they're there. You've all heard about it, seen it. Ocean vessels. <coughs> They've got low vessel shipping rates, there's increased scrapping, they're increasing uh, their bulk cargoes now, uh, shipping. Now let's talk about this very interesting topic. Everybody hears about China. Well, the one belt, one road, what they call Ober, is their target. 
and they're going to move as much as they can from China to Europe. Target, 11 days. Beijing to Berlin. They've got that in their five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan. But guess what? They're already doing it. There are 15 cities in China right now that are shipping to 16 cities in Europe by rail cross-country. And they've got contracts with all the companies, countries that they go through, and agreements with rail, and everything's in place. And it just happened not very long ago, because they've only done around 2,000 trips. But it's happening. This is a fun one. The Marine Silk Road. You see all those circles on there? China owns the port. See the one that says Djibouti? That's on the Red Sea? The entrance to the Red Sea is the, is the Gulf of Aden, the most highly pirated area in the world. But guess what happens in Djibouti? The Chinese military has a base, their first base outside of China. They got a full-blown base there. They built the airport. They also built an airport for Djibouti. And they also put in rail lines and pipelines going into Ethiopia, where they're taking potash and they're taking gas and oil out. If you look down a little further, Mombasa and Zanzibar, Zanzibar on the island. If you take a look at that port down there, one of China's long-term objectives, and they stated it about four years ago, is that they want 20 million tons of steelmaking capacity in Africa. Well, guess what? My best guess is it's already happening right there. <clears throat> We've heard a lot about China's or their production and consumption and so on. I won't go into this, but they have a massive advantage in their blast furnaces. And they build big blast furnaces. And they're new. And what happens is the rest of the world doesn't have the same capacity size-wise. NAFTA. You got politics, you got trade cases, you got the auto industry, you got the residential housing holding, you got the industrial commercial. I suspect 2018 things are going to take off in NAFTA with regards to President Trump and things he can do. The oil and gas self sufficiency and the heavy equipment and the appliances. <clears throat> Steel consumption, we've talked a little bit about that, but I'll leave that for now and the steel production. Becky went over that very thoroughly for us. Utilization rates. Every 1% change in the utilization rate that you see posted every week represents 54,000 tons. OK? That represents a vessel. 27 barges, 645 rail cars, and over 2,000 trucks. That's the effect that 1% change in the utilization has. So you say, oh, great, the rate's going up. How does it affect you? There's one way right there. When you get the rail cars, the barges, can you order a vessel? Now, the total March purchased scrap requirement was 4.2 million tons. Bushling was 30% of that. Shred was 45. Heavy melt was 25. 1.23 million tons of bushling for the month. And the monthly average bush, based on the production of the flat side, 
with a 20% yield loss equates to the number required. So there's a very tight relationship here between the maximum spread to shred, as I mentioned earlier. If you replace bush partially with 50% DRI, you'll see a 40 to 50% drop in that spread. And that's happened since the late 2014 when one of the major steel companies put in DRI facilities in New Orleans. When that started happening, this happened. Well, there you go, guys. There's your product. There's what it looks like. But I want you to notice one thing. There's the copper, too. That's four points of copper. And that's in factory bush coming from a blast furnace. Key point here. The shredded could be 40. The heavy melt, 30 to 40 also, okay? But the target and shred, of course, is to get it down to 17 if you really work the system. This is what 200,000 tons of 80-20 looks like sitting on a dock in Rotterdam, just to give you a concept if you haven't seen that much scrap. The exporters certainly have. Now, the steelmaker's focus. What does the steelmaker want in life? He wants to be sure that he can eliminate the assumptions he's making about stuff. For example, you ship him a truckload, a rail car, a barge load of material. He doesn't know. It has a rating, it's shred, it's heavy melt, it's bushling. That's it. It may or may not come from a specific known entity, which he has a good chance of knowing what it is by dead melts that they've tested in the past. But the bottom line, it's a still an assumption. Raw material controls, that's his feedstock. And then one of the things they're looking at, if you take a look at the duties and everything and the effect it's had on the market, utilization rates have gone up because the, the tariffs and so on have kicked in and they're doing their job. The other major thing that they're doing, and I was involved with this before I retired, was total cost of ownership. Massive projects at all the plants. And what that means is you go in and you find out the things you can reduce the cost on, and then you equate the cost savings directly to EBITDA. Now you know you've saved it, or it doesn't count. BOFs versus EAFs cost. Now, I built myself a model that puts the two of them face to face, and it's measured against their liquid steel costs, and I use published market prices to do this without getting into the fine points associated with it. But if you look back in October 14th, the BOFs were winning. And if you take the BOF, and then you take EAF number two, which is your pig iron bushling scrap, which is going to compete with the integrated premium steel. EAF number one is a high percentage of scrap, which is your long carbon facilities. And the last one is all about using DRI with a 60% charge mix. This is key. That's how the EAFs can compete. They have to have a minimum. April this year, on the 18th, I did a spot check on the prices again. And here we see that the BOF is ahead of the electrics again, because they're at $400 because of the prices of the scrap. There's a picture for you. That's mid-streaming DRI for those that aren't familiar with the systems and you may be out in Utah or something and don't get a chance to be down on the river. This is a, a quick cost comparison 
associated with a BOF furnace and an electric arc furnace. And I won't really get into the details on it, but the bottom line is the BOF is going to do it in 30 minutes. The electric arc is going to be just a little less than an hour as a cost-saving measure. The other thing is if you look at the copper levels that an integrated can attain, it's rock bottom. It's down to four, four copper in there. And that's huge. You cannot do that with straight scrap. You can't get there. Metal pricing. I think I've touched on this a bit, but I'll quickly review. You start in China with the iron ore and the coal and the coke. What you saw from the previous slides were the measuring items that I, I used. And then you come to Turkey and its balancing act. And then you come to NAFTA. And you assess your local, your regional, and the dynamics of everything that's going on in NAFTA. <clears throat> the miscellaneous, of course, are the seasonal factors and so on. Chaos factors. This is the one I wanted to get to. First of all, eliminating assumptions. But the Internet of Things is going to change your world. I wasn't kidding when I said everybody should have an electric arc furnace and tie it to a 3D printer that's doing selective manufacturing for parts that nobody else can consider making. Take, for example, your pick and pull. Guy comes in to get a part. You don't have it. Say, OK, tell me what the part looks like. You got a picture of it? Yeah, got it here. Got the old part. Here's what it looks like. It broke. Well, let me take a picture of it. I'll make it for you. Wow. Tell me that doesn't change the world. The other thing about 3D printing, they are now mixing powdered products that you can't mix when they're liquid. And they're getting all new characteristics to work with and they're experimenting with. They're doing this for engine parts for airplanes. I say to you guys, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, smart dust. I walk into the hotel, go to the registration. There's an odor in the air. Oh, that smells nice. What a great welcome. Smart dust just landed on me. I walk to the elevator. Mr. Harris, welcome to our place. Go to elevator G. We'll take you to the 30th floor. No buttons to push, no waiting around. That's the kind of thing that's happening. The dust, the smart dust, we're talking about sensors. Right now, there's 10.5 billion sensors out in the marketplace, in your phones, in your watches, in your Fitbits, the whole works. But guess what? By 2020, there's going to be one trillion of them. And there's people out there now that are trying to program all this. The IT associated with this. This is an explosion. You think the internet was something. Internet created transparency and eliminated a lot of jobs. The brokerage business suffered big time where they weren't talking. Transparency opened that up and changed the world, and everybody adjusted. But the information flow was transparent. But it was people interpreting the information. Well, what happens when the trucks and the rail cars have the sensors in the walls all the way around? And they come into the steel plant. And before it gets to the scale, I get a report that says the chemistry of that load is this, the density of that load is this, and the weight, I'm going to get off the scale. But it can also be calculated. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with one last comment here. I'm running at the end of the time. 
But drone services, guess what? Dial up drone services and say, what's the inventory in the south, the southeast for scrap? And the drone services goes out and they check everybody's scrap yards. And then you do an assessment on who needs what and what's available, and so on. If you do that globally, I actually did it with satellites back in the mid-2000s. And I could do it. This is available today. I was told to pull back because of intrusion. OK. Second thing, you look at the trucks that are out there that are coming to your place. And you can't get rail cars. If we had truck trains, so the last three trucks don't have an operator. They're just following. Why not? I've said enough. If you got any questions, I welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, John. I hope that we've stimulated your, your minds a little bit and got you to, to think of a couple questions. So if you do, feel free to go to the one with microphones, or if you're down front, front I'll be glad to, to listen to them. And if not, we'll start a little Q&A &A among ourselves and definitely want to hear your, hear your opinions. First thing I want to get back to, we, we keep talking a lot about China. And, you know, for me, it's always confusing because, you know, all you hear in the news is, oh, there's tariffs on, and China says they're going to cut production, and, and then we hear today that their production, you know, has hit another record high, and, and where's all this going to go? So I guess the question I have for both of you is, exactly what does that mean? At the end of the day, do we really think China at some point in time will curtail their production to some degree? And, you know, all of a sudden we've seen an administration that, has gone from, oh, they're the bad guys, to, eh, maybe they're okay. <laughs> so I'd like to get both of your opinion on that. Go ahead. So uh, for sure, I do believe they will be cutting production in China. Um, they have a 400 million ton overcapacity. In one of the slides, and I didn't mention it, but their utilization rate is only 70% too. Um, so it's not like they're operating full out while the rest of the world is suffering and not operating. So we're all operating at about the same level. And that really gets determined based on cost of production. Um, but it's not going to, but eliminating the overcapacity in China is not going to solve the problem because we're not going to go back to the time where the developing world needs steel from the developed world. So the paradigm has shifted, the business models changed. We still need to be able to operate um, at a cost competitive level in our own markets. And what you, what you, that's significant that's changed in the last two years, or maybe even three years, is a shift back to protectionism, mercantilism. You know, it used to be the world is global, barriers are, are falling, we can, we, we'll all have a great big party, the pie will grow, and the pie is not growing now. now I think part of that's gonna be resolved as the economy starts to grow again. And I think as you work through all of this uncertainty, the economies will start to grow again. Uh, it's just right now we're in a discontent type period. John? Uh, I have a little different comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that where China is right now, they're holding. And as I explained with the uh, Marine Silk Road and the Ober, uh, right across the country rail, they are spending tremendous amounts of money and I guarantee you that the products that they're building with are Chinese. For example, in the Suez Canal, at both ends of the Suez Canal, they have massive container ports. They spent over $1.4 billion building two container ports one at either end of the Suez. And then they have a port in Greece that was on my, my slide. And that material is moving through there. My best guess is that they are using their steel up as they're growing their expansion in an economic fashion. Now, if you take these, you take the Uber road, or the Ober road, sorry, and you take a look at it going right across the country, which is 9,000 kilometers or miles, let's say it's kilometers, 
everywhere along that, there's going to be exploding economies. They're going to be building on that route to service. And then all of a sudden, going right across the country, they're going to be expanding. And part of it is in their own country to get the raw materials out of the center core of China. And that's sort of my vision. I do not think that they're going to cut back. Yes, the numbers say that there's a lot of extra capacity. But for them to cut back, everything that I've seen, even in my travels when I spent a couple of years there, the bottom line is they cannot afford to shut down a community by cutting off a steel plant. For example, I saw a single blast furnace that produced very little iron, and it was supporting a town of 50,000 employees. You shut that place down, that's 50,000 people, but the steel plant also controls all the services of the town. The water, the sewage, the transportation, the banking, everything. So for them to shut down capacity, it's a threat to them in terms of people's revolt. So I do not see it happening. I see it holding, and then for what I'm saying. You know, it's, it's been amazing to me in the last, I don't know, six months, how much political turmoil there's been everywhere, whether it's been through elections, through wars, or... It just seems like every day you turn on the TV and there's something happening. But what, what do you think the implications are for the recent developments in Turkey, you know, with the elections? Uh, what's going to happen there? What impact do you think it will have on their industry, which obviously will impact their demand for scrap? So um, I have friends in Turkey. I talk to them all the time. Um, some of my friends are trying to get out just because it's uncertain. Um, on the manufacturing side, on the scrap side, um, what my feedback from my sources there is they're waiting to see what the impact is going to be. But I, I don't know that I've heard from anybody that they're thrilled and think it's going in the right direction. So I think it's concerning um, from a Western perspective and from an economic perspective. If I look at Turkey, they have a population bubble that is like the youth in this room, as opposed, as opposed to a population in many other countries that have a group, the population bubble is my age. And they've got a lot of innovative and creative young people that are expanding their country. I recognize that they're having turmoil because they're surrounded by it and it's within their country and there's a lot of ethnic groups and so on. That will continue. But I think because of they have a strong young population that I think that they will get through it and they will progress forward. Let's turn our attention a little bit towards Europe. Uh, you know, we've had the Brexit that's come out, and now we've got elections going on in France and a couple other countries there. And even within these countries, there seems to be this political unrest that creates a lot of economic uncertainty. And so I'm curious, what, what kind of an impact do you think that'll have on, on global and or U.S. steel demand, at, at least in the short term? None of us will know the long term, but in the short term, what do you see happening? Well, I think the political unrest uh, is a is a consequence of the migration issues, uh, which is a consequence of the global unrest um, and wars in different countries. Um, for sure, because of it, I've been saying for two years that decision makers are distracted, that they can't really focus on running their own business because there are all these other uh, things that are distracting or demanding their attention. Um, and, but, uh, and I think the bigger driver is not necessarily the political changes necessarily, but the shift in the global GDP and the global use of steel away from the developed countries. So the, the, the bigger question is, how effective are we going to be at finding strategies for dealing with that, right? And it is so fascinating. Again, I keep going back to Peter Marcus, but I worked with him for a decade. And uh, for those of you who know World Steel Dynamics, Peter would walk around going, oh, they need to shut the steel mills. They need to shut the steel mills. And his partner, Carlos, would say, who? Who's going to shut? You, you close yours. I don't want to close mine, 
right? So there's this issue of how, how do you consolidate? How do you manage your industry effectively? And the truth of the matter, as long as you're cost effective on a, on a global basis, um, there's no reason for you to exit the business, right? So when, when, the, um, the, when, the Euro, when the currencies work in your favor, it gives whatever country happens to have the attractive currency a big advantage in the marketplace. So I, I don't think it's gonna be easily solved. I think as the economy start growing again, that'll solve some of it. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know that I look at specifically at the political unrest disrupting the steel industry specifically. John probably disagrees with me. <laughs> no, I basically don't have any comment on the, uh, on the, the politics of it. And, uh, and I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to visit almost all of the steel companies in uh, Europe at one stage in my life when there was a consolidation of steel companies. And there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things at these steel plants. And I think they're gonna find a way. They do not have, um, their scrap prices and their steel prices always seem to be in balance as opposed to the NAFTA region that is kind of driven more associated with the flat carbon electric and the scrap prices. So my gut feel on it is that there will be no major changes. They'll go up and down with the flow. I mean, one of the things that does happen is Europe has a lot of prime scrap that they do not need. And that's why we see continuous cargoes of prime scrap coming to NAFTA because of the flat carbon electric appetite for prime scrap. So. And to clarify that, the electric arc furnaces are long carbon. I mentioned that earlier. The blast furnace, or the BOFs, do not need prime scrap. You know, it's interesting in talking about this. Uh, Israel's economist has showed us some charts recently showing the export of scrap from the United States. And when I've looked at this over two different periods, the thing that I always find interesting is, yeah, your traditional players are there, Turkey and some other ones but you're starting to see names pop up that you didn't see in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I just find that so intriguing because I think as, as scrap dealers, I think the challenge for us is to continue to think outside of that normal box. Sure, everybody thinks we export to Turkey, but I, I think there are countries that if you go and look on Israel's website that we export quite a bit of material to that you don't think of. And one that just pop, popped off the charts the other day was Greece. And, you know, that just really surprised me. So I think that's one of the challenges we're going to face going forward is to think of the new and growing areas, not just the traditional ones. One of the reasons, though, Greg, before you change the subject, sure. that people look at Turkey specifically with the scrap exports is because, and John made this point really well in his presentation, they are really the swing factor country. Um, they, they don't have laws that require them to operate their businesses every single day, and they truly are margin players. They're going to turn it up and produce when they can make a margin on it. If they can't make a margin on producing the scrap and they can make a margin on, on buying the billet and converting it, they're totally going to do that. Um, and I think they, at least from my sources, they've moved a little bit away from the Chinese billet because of the quality, but, um, but they are always looking at... Um, well, if I, if I can't make money in rebar, I'll buy the scrap and make billet. I mean, they're very market-oriented. Um, and again, it goes back to how hungry are you? How well are you paying attention to the market versus how many years have you been in business and you just assume business is going to come to you? And, and that's part of the differential, too, between the developed world and the developing world, right? There's a little bit of a we got fat, dumb, and happy kind of mentality. And I don't think we fat have that as much anymore. And I think the European mills, particularly when John was talking about those mills, there really has been a lot of investment to modernize their, um, their operations and to look at their, their products. And there's been a lot of innovation. If you think about it, over half of the steels produced today, uh, at least going into the automotive market, didn't exist 10 years ago. So, so the, the industry is growing young. It is trying to look at these ways to, to remain competitive. And if you think about it, that's the one way to differentiate yourself because the new kids on the block haven't learned how to make those steels yet. And, and China is getting better at making those steels, um, but, but there's still a little bit of a tribal knowledge advantage if you look at that in the West. 
I want to roll a couple of these questions together because they definitely relate. And this is talking about the current administration. You know, is the so-called Trump effect resulting in uh, materially better conditions for the U.S. steel industry, both short and long term? And I'll go ahead and parlay that along with, you know, talking about the recent trade cases. You know, I think those, you know, definitely are, are all tied together. Do you think they're having the intended effect? And, and will that be long term positive and healthy for the U.S. steel industry? So I'm a big free trade person, um, and Dan D'Amico would be mad at me for saying this, but, um, and I, I don't believe if they'd done one and done, it would have worked. But they have, they have successfully, the U.S. steel industry has successfully gone back to a definition of harm that is actually measuring harm as opposed to uh, decimation. And so that's been very effective. Um, it seems like, depending upon which part of the industry you're looking at, um, for instance, in wire rod, they put in some duties, and basically the wire rod imports stopped, but then the final products of all the wire rod products came in. Mm -hmm. so, so it's just this diversionary measure. Um, for sure, in the U.S. right now, the flat rolled overhang of inventory is gone. So by that measurement alone, it's been effective. Um, but all of this was, was happened under the last administration. Right, so now speaking specifically to Trump, um, and, and I'll, just as a disclaimer, I'm a Trump fan. I was at the inauguration. Um, I, you know, obviously it's very encouraging to see your president inviting the executives in and saying, make things in America again. We're gonna support America. But for instance, I have business cards made out of steel, and it took me four years to find somebody in the U.S. to make them. So to me, it's more a matter of, is the capacity even available? You know, when, when he signed the executive order saying the pipelines are gonna be made out of pipe made in the USA, well, the truth of the matter is, there's no melting capacity at any pipe makers anymore. So that sounds good, but it's not very practical, right? So, so it's nice to hear the rhetoric. I think that actually the economy recovering is gonna be as big a help as the, as the support verbally. John, your thoughts? Well, NAFTA is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and seeing I'm north of the border, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've got about 15 million tons of steel that we make up there a year, and I don't really think much is going to change, um, except, but since uh, Trump has, uh, President Trump has developed a huge thump in his step, I have seen the uh, border crossings coming into the U.S. have a hundred more questions than was normal before President Trump was in play. Mm -hmm. So he has definitely stepped up and said, we're going to do something, whether it's just strictly about NAFTA. But the, one of the issues here associated with Canada is we have so much finished steel, semi-finished steel going back and forth across the border in terms of car manufacturing where we're making cars for the U.S. and they're coming back here and all the specs are built for the U.S., whether it's Honda, GM, or Ford, or Chrysler. So the Southern Ontario marketplace, um, I think the flow is just gonna keep going and I don't see any major effect for the NAFTA at this point in time. But I definitely do see that, and my gut feel is that President Trump is going to shake things up. <laughs> and as a part of that, the steel industry, I believe, will benefit. But it may not be into 2018 when his foot hits the ground and you hear that thump. Are, are you concerned with, with some of these measures that they'll be retaliatory protectionists? measures overseas that could hinder U.S. exports, you know, obviously like a trade war with China or something like that, what's your feeling? Go ahead, Don. If, if I look at China, they're global, and we're only one piece of the pie for them, and we are one of the major pieces of the pie, and I definitely think that they're not going to take anything sitting down. So there will be a scrap in play, but the negotiations and everything and, the, and the, the fight that they'll put up will be over years. It's not gonna be played out over a quarter, 
like we may do for our businesses in NAFTA. They have 20-year, 10-year, 5-year plans. And they're going to gear up those plans to get what they want and make the adjustments accordingly. And if it's away from NAFTA for a period of time, it'll happen. But it'll be back. I don't think it's re reasonable to expect that we're going to be able to put an across the border tax and just shut things down. I think that harms too many other things. Yeah. And and honestly, again, the steel industry is just not that important in the scope of things, unfortunately, anymore. So it's going to be give and take. It's going to be part of the negotiation. You're definitely going to have lots of roaring and lots of, you know, we're going to hold the line on this. But at the end of the day, deals are going to get made. And he's a deal maker, and that's what you that's expect. Right. Um, but, but again, I believe, I truly believe he uh, truly in his heart supports the steel industry. Sure. And that's a good thing because at least we're back on the radar. Well, just by the people that he put in place. Absolutely. Yeah. But I'll tell you, um, and this is just my personal opinion, uh, when you saw Dan D'Amico not take the trade rep position and pass it to Lighthouser, that to me was a huge signal that, that, that the decision making was going to be more rational as opposed to positional. Yeah. Yeah. Don't disagree with you there. You know, recently we saw the iron ore prices start to come back down. Of course, that can change next week, uh, as we've seen the stock market do this week. <laughs> but do, do you see any impact on the scrap market uh, in the near future with the drop in iron ore prices that we've seen? Or is this just kind of a glitch, and have we kind of reached uh, maybe a little bit of an equilibrium here on prices? I don't think we've reached the iron ore floor yet. I mean, the iron ore companies, the major three, can operate at somewhere around $20 a ton and make a profit. Their numbers are still well above that right now. And you're not, it's going to come down, but it's all associated more with the demand from China associated with their demand for iron ore. That's the driving force on the iron ore. And there's plenty of iron ore. As I mentioned, there's approximately 50 million tons that's excess or over and above their normal production this year. Any comment? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, seasonally you're going into a period in the summer where things are usually slower. Um, so I think the price is going to, I mean, it's going to do what it does seasonally and cyclically. It's going to be up and down. Uh, but I also agree with John that fundamentally uh, supply and demand would tell you that eventually the market reverts to the cash cost to produce. So there's an awful lot of additional downside risk, if you want to call it that, specifically on iron ore pricing, than upside potential. Okay. If, if we go back a, a second to the model that I put up there with the numbers on it, and you looked at it and you, you saw that there was an iron ore spot price, there was a coal spot price, metallurgical coal spot price, and then there was a natural gas spot price on there. And those were the, the pivotal points to determine what's going to happen in the marketplace. The coal has had a huge rise because of Cyclone Diane that finally, one of the things that happened last fall, the meteorologist predicted that the cyclone season this year was going to be approximately 67% more severe. And they were just hoping that nothing made landfall. Hmm. Because they can have all these cyclones. If they don't make landfall, it doesn't matter. But Diane did landfall, destroying ports and railways and everything else. And they're just getting out from under it now. And that's why you're seeing the coal prices start to come down. And we've got about five or six minutes here, and I've got a couple final questions, but if there's anybody in the audience that has one, I'd like to get you in if, if you have one. Yep, we have one on the top. Sure. 
okay? <laughs> the scrap in China, the prompt scrap in China, satisfies their entire needs for their scrap for all of their furnaces. Normally, a BOF furnace takes 10% purchase scrap. They were operating at 5%, and it was mostly home scrap. They have now increased that percentage up to about 8%. And one of the things they're recognizing is that they do have this surplus of scrap, and they're going to try and absorb more into their BOF operations. They haven't even started to collect obsolete scrap. But you must remember, in 2000, they were only making 100 million tons of steel. And if you go back another seven years before that, they were 50, 60 million tons of steel. <clears throat> All of that steel that they've made is being used in their own country, most of it with the exception of some of the exports we're experiencing. So it's not really going to come to life until another, say, four or five years where it'll start to happen. And yes, that has to be a concern. They are now exporting scrap into the Asian tigers. And I'm sure you guys are aware of that, the traders. Hey, Becky, any thoughts? Well, I'm going to defer to John because he spends a lot more time looking at it than I do. But also keep in mind that uh, scrap is not scrap is not scrap, right? So uh, the original investments and the reason China built their steel industry was to build their infrastructure. So scrap that went into train or steel that went into trains and went into rail lines and went into bridges and went into high rises, whatever, that scrap's not really going to come back to the market for 40 or 50 years. So that's pretty long down the path. Where you see uh, the quicker turn on scrap is cars and uh, appliances and more the consumer scrap. And in fact, we were talking about this, that the, the, the consumer age in China hasn't really taken off yet. Uh, people have gotten cars or gotten into apartments, but they're, they're not uh, Americanized enough to think they need to replace their dishwasher every four years the way we do. So it's a little bit of longer duration to finally impact when that scrap comes out. You realize, of course, it takes 75 bicycles to make a ton of scrap. <laughs> <laughs> in, our, in our final couple of minutes here, one, one final question for you, and it's one I'm sure we all uh, are anxious to hear is that do you expect to see more consolidation in the U.S. steel industry and on the scrap side? Scrap side, I can't, I can't really give you a good feel for that one because you've got the exporters and then you've got the regionals. And I suspect that there is going to be more consolidation because it's a tough market and it's a cash flow market, whereas the old privately owned, I'll put the scrap behind the trees and save it and that's my retirement package. That is kind of disappearing. So I think there will be some consolidation in the scrap side. On the steel side, Becky gave an excellent slide of all the companies that are currently in play. We've already taken out over 30 companies that have been consolidated down and there are still some pockets. We, were may, we may see some more um, consolidation in the steel industry. I think the industry continues to evolve. I mean, obviously, Big River Steel's just started up, um, and that's going to put pressure on older, higher-cost uh, facilities. So I think that the industry is going to continue to evolve. I don't know that I would call it consolidate um, because I don't know that it's ever going to that it's going to become a lot less as a total figure, but I think it will continue to change. Um, and I think that the role that scrap plays supplying that industry has definitely changed in the last 10 years. Um, again, on the bar side, most scrap um, sources can be used, but on the flat rolled side, uh, most metallic mixes now are at least. 20 or 30 and sometimes 50% away from scrap. So um, as an industry, I think the impact of how your business is changing is going to actually be more, uh, needs to be a more concern to you than how many yards are out there. Sure, no, good point. Well, I definitely want to thank you for attending this afternoon. We want to remind you of the Ferris uh, reception. So when you exit, if you'll go out the doors to our right, your left, and uh, the reception will be up there. We hope to talk to you again. If you have any additional questions, we'll be glad to speak to you out there. Thank you very much.